Good morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the third annual Jonathan Bayless Conference. This is the first in a series of programs today that will cover the rich and complex history of Rocky Neck. And we begin with three siblings, known as the Sibleys. And I don't really have to introduce the family, the Sibley family to anybody, but I will. Um, these three, Liz, far to the left, is um, a sculptor who was born and raised in Gloucester and now lives in New Hampshire. And her work is available for viewing all over the North Shore. George stayed here, and born and raised and stayed here, and he runs the MTG Wharf and the Low Tide Marina here on Rocky Neck. And Mern Sibley, also born and raised here, went to the Midwest, came back, and is a, a, a scholar of biology in its many forms. And with that, I will leave you to, for all of us to learn what it was like growing up on Rocky Neck. Thank you, Susan. I'm, I will start. Um, so I'm the, the fourth out of five of us siblings. And our parents um, were Bill and Peg Sibley, um, known in Jonathan's books as Watt Sibber and Teddy Sibber, for those of you who've dipped into those works. Um, so at the time that I was born, our family had lived for a number of years at 22 Rocky Neck Avenue. And then when I was about two and a half, we made the big move up the hill to Mount Pleasant Avenue. And um, so I had kind of more of an inland childhood than did George and, um, and Liz. So George is number three, and Liz is the eldest in the birth order. So they, they can talk more about Rocky Neck um, childhood intensity. Um, but my center of gravity did shift to Rocky Neck when I was probably in about the fifth, sixth grade, something like that. I decided that um, I decided to start coming down the hill um, to visit this very interesting place uh, here on Rocky Neck that my father provided. And before I talk about that interesting place, um, I just wanted to give you a little background about my father's movements because he was a very predictable person in his way. So, and it was kind of a seasonal pattern. So, in the spring and summer, you could very likely find him on um, the uh, Moore Sibley Wharf down on East Main Street, or um, he'd be on his fishing boat, um, Peggy Bell, which is shown in the lovely drawing there. Um, that's um, up on the ways for repairs every summer. And um, so he'd be out doing those things. But then in the fall and winter, he, his, his um, likely place of, to be found would be on Rocky Neck um, in the small brown building that today is the Mary Hughes uh, jewelry shop. Um, and of course, George and Ellen live in the back. But he was in the front. That was his workshop. And that's where you could find him. And he presided over a meeting place where people really um, could come and just spend time. And he would probably use the word loiter, you know. But anyway, they would come, and it, the company was convivial. Um, and so I was drawn to that. And people were welcome to come and, and converse, or you could just stand around and observe what was happening. There was no, you know, no, no particular expectations of you. You certainly didn't make an appointment or call ahead. You just showed up to see what was going on. And um, so Sibs and Cultural Society, you can come by later and take a good look at this, would you call it a plaque, I guess? I don't know, yeah. at this item. This was uh, created by one of the regulars who used to show up um, at the place. And uh, he, he coined the term Sibs and Cultural Society because many topics were discussed, which of a cultural and not so cultural nature. And you could also read it, depending how your eye moves, you could read it as Sibs Cultural End Society. Like, this is kind of it. It's not going to continue. You both could, terms, both terms yeah. were appropriate. Both yes. were appropriate, right. absolutely. So you can take a look at that later if you can't see it from where you're sitting. Um, so if you were to step through the front door of Sibs Cultural End Society, you would be in a dim, cozy space, and there would be um, a big workbench along the right-hand side, and t various tools, of course, a table saw, a band saw, then a large open space that was often filled with a boat building or boat repair project. That's to take up a lot of room, obviously. And then there was a stove in the back, a barrel stove that um, kept the place very warm with wood scraps. 
And so next to the stove, there was a chair that um, often repaired with fishnet that my father would take a, a seat when he had some idle time, um, which was, you know, here or there, quite here not, not there. infrequent. He would be found in that chair. And so uh, to my knowledge, I was the only kid that actually showed up there regularly. Most of the, the clientele were middle-aged folks um, and um, basically didn't pay much attention to me at all, and that was okay. I liked just being there, being accepted, listening and watching, seeing what was going on. And it was really an assortment of characters. It was people who had regular nine to five jobs who would show up after work to see what was happening. It would be um, artists and writers who would show up. It was um, various people who worked on the water in some capacity. So it was, a, it was a good diversity of perspectives. And it was really a place of many jokes and tales. And often these stories were simply referred to. You didn't just um, tell the whole story. You would maybe make a comment and people would know exactly what you were talking about. <laughs> so one example um, of that, I can give an example of a story, is the great race between Bill Blanford and Joe Garland. So this was a true story. Um, I may not have all the background, but I can give you my child's sort of perspective on it. So Bill Blanford was a, um, a genial fellow. He was a custodian at um, Beauport Museum up on East, um, Eastern Point. And if you haven't ever been there, you really need to go because it's a wonderful place. And he, he took care of that place. And then um, he liked to ride a bike and he had a, a unique way of riding a bike. It was very gracious, very slow, and the bike would move along. And my father used to marvel that the bike didn't just kind of fall over, but it never did, always upright, kept going. And so that was Bill's style, and he would ride his bike down from Eastern Point to Sibs Cultural and Society. And, um, and then Joe um, would usually get there on his sporty um, convertible. He had a small convertible that he liked to drive. Now, it so happened that one day Joe actually fell and broke his leg. Um, the story was he fell off a teeter-totter. I don't know the full story, but something like that. And so he could no longer drive his sports car because he couldn't handle the clutch with his broken leg. So he was getting around on crutches. And one day he took it upon himself with the idea, I'm going to go down to see Bill and, and folks, um, you know, just hobble down there from his place on Eastern Point down to Rocky Neck with my crutches. And I don't really know how this whole thing started exactly, but somehow the two men more or less started off at the same time, Bill on his bicycle and Joe on his crutches. And uh, maybe the whole, along the way, Joe's competitive instincts were aroused, like, OK, this is a race, Joe decided. And maybe Bill was also part of that decision. Mm -hmm. And they basically uh, became, it became a rather suspenseful competition as Joe and Bill rounded um, the corner and got down to Rocky Neck Avenue, the causeway by today's parking lot. You know, it was pretty much neck and neck with Bill on his bicycle and Joe hobbling along on crutches. And then at the very last minute, Joe turned on the speed and pulled ahead and won the race. So this was quite a remarkable happening. And this story was referred to and retold many, many times. And you should know that at Sibs Cultural Lens Society, there was always, you know, while the stories were going on and while the conversation was happening, there was always some kind of project going on. And all I had to do as a kid was, as he would say, feign persuado interest. You know, you sort of show up. And he would explain what exactly the project was all about. And you just had to feign persuado interest. So that was good. That was easy. And in a, in a lot of these projects, there was much use of cast off industrial materials. So I brought a couple of these examples here, um, which you can, again, take a look at later if you can't see from your seat. So things like masonite sheets, styrofoam sheets, aluminum lawn chair pieces, you know, whatever sturdy materials that would lend themselves. And um, so, yes, yeah, so the bandsaw would be employed to cut these lovely um, creatures out of styrofoam. And here they are, what? 50 years later, still hanging, you know, that's sort of the beauty and the ugliness of styrofoam, right? It's still with us, here it is. Um, and I don't quite remember the, what, what the reason was why birds were such a, a strong, I mean, I was interested in parakeets as a kid, maybe that was why, and he was sort of humoring me, I don't know. But definitely these birds seem to crop up yeah. a lot. Yeah. And Giant yes. posterior birds, yes. exactly yes. right. Giant yes, true. giant posterior right. birds. We can elaborate on that. Yes, that is very true. Um, 
So much of the winter, there was some type of boat building or boat repair project going on at Sibs Cultural End. And if, really, I remember two vessels especially fondly. One was a, a skiff that was, had kind of a blunt bow, and we painted it brick red. And that skiff, I would row around Gloucester Harbor and have different adventures. I'd go to Ten Pound Island and climb up the lighthouse tower to get that really big perspective on things. Or um, occasionally, I'd go as far as Freshwater Cove, and there was a tower there by the Cardinal Cushing Villa property, and you could climb up in that one, too. So it was always good to get a, a high view of things. And um, the sad part was that that skiff was stolen at some time in the 1980s, and we never did mm. recover it. It just disappeared. And then the second vessel um, that I was very fond of and saw the whole process of it being made was the beautiful, quirky, small sailboat christened Sublime Submarine. Mm -hmm. And that was built for Gracie Schraft, who's here today, back in 1968. And that was um, a wonderful process to see. It, it, I saw the whole thing from a pencil sketch on the back of a tide calendar to you know, those graceful bends of the plywood that he did to then that smelly, that really pungent coating of fiberglass stuff that got put on, and then finally the gaudy orange and green paint job that made it perfect. So that was a, that was a beautiful process just to see, and that vessel is still sailing today, and recently Fran Cleary has fixed it up, so that's, that's great. And um, one interesting aspect as a kid, and again, there's lots of things when you're a kid you don't really understand how these things happen, was the transformation that happened. So Sib's cultural end would disappear every year. So I talked about the seasonality. Well, to get ready for summer, that whole place had to be cleaned out. So all of a sudden, the workbenches were gone, the sawdust was gone, everything was gone, and replaced with scrubbed wooden floors and white walls. I never quite understood how that happened, but then Tom O'Hara's gallery would be there and it was wonderful. So it was a great switch um, that happened every year. And in closing, I should mention that while my father did provide this great place, it wasn't the only place for people to gather on Rocky Neck. There was also the English bookshop. I mean, he didn't acquire quite or attract quite so many people, but definitely people were welcome to come in and hang out and even look at a book or even buy a book. And also, of course, um, the establishment now known as Sailor Stands, it had many other names through the years, um, Peters, Drift In, Wits End, um, that was a definite also gathering place on Rocky Neck. So it's good to think about all these places that brought people together back then. And also, he was always outside of the railway in the summer, because when we were there, all his friends were out there. It was really fun. Yeah, so that, yeah, he didn't exactly vanish, but, but the place, but yeah, you're right. So there was some, as it was an outdoor scene, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And I'm now going to pass it on to George, who's going to continue on with All right, I will memories. continue on. Um, and I will try, I've already wrecked one piece of art today. I will try not to wreck another when I stand. Um, my remarks are going to be a little, I'm going to touch on the book a bit and some on Rocky Neck also. Um, a dear friend of mine, Ken Rieff, was also friendly with Jonathan. Uh, some of you may have seen a piece Ken wrote in the most recent Bayless Society notebook about his experience interviewing Jonathan toward the end of Jonathan's life. As I think in the case with at least some of us, Ken found Jonathan's book somewhat discursive. A number of years ago, Ken told me of buying Jonathan's newest book. Ken then sat down and opened it up to page one. He read deeply and steadily for over an hour. Then he turned to page two. <laughs> I knew Jonathan as a friend mostly of my mother's. Um, they were part of an intellectual coterie here in Gloucester in the 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, they'd all voted for Adley Stevenson, of course, against Eisenhower, and even for Stuart Hughes when he ran against Ted Kennedy for Senate in 1962. They were quite progressive. As I recall, besides Jonathan and my mother, the gang included Charles Olson, Vincent Farini, a young Peter Anastas, Father Smythe, who you'll hear about later on from the oratory up on the hill. Certainly there were, there were others too. My dad, Jonathan's Watt Sibber, was not part of this group. I think my father viewed them with amusement, 
As people removed from the practicalities of life. <laughs> My father's crowd were his friends who gathered at his workshop here on Rocky Neck. The officious headquarters that Jonathan describes in Gloucester Tide with battered easy chair, an overstuffed rocker. These were items made by my father out of bits of this and that, lashed together. Jonathan was, in my observation, only on the fringe of this group. It's telling that Watt in Gloucester Tide is described as the only native marooner among Caleb's friends. A member of dad's group, the writer Joe Garland, remarked at my father's funeral that my father had had time for a fool, but none for a faker. And Jonathan echoes this when he has what say of himself, I may have great regard for the regardless, but I have little use for the useless. <laughs> One thread of my dad's persona was playing the colorful local denizen. Prone, as Jonathan writes, to patently idiosyncratic expressions springing from some distant Wessex ancestry. Of course, my father was only first generation American. His father came from England. It occurred to me that Jonathan may have divides Watt's last name from the sound of our name, our family name, and the name of Collie Sibber, who was a 18th century English actor known for playing the malaprop, very much in my father's vein. The other locus of my dad's group was the coffee shop across the street, as Sailor Stans, as Myrne has mentioned. It's called Spartans in Gloucester Tide, and was run by young Peter Nass's father, Peter the Elder. Here, they would have coffee and lunch, and sit, and sit, and sit. Rocky Neck was a working class to middle class neighborhood in the 1950s and through the 60s. Art galleries, restaurants, and boatyards, of which my father's was of a type, lined the Argo Cove side of Rocky Neck. And Argo Cove is another one of those great Jonathan renamings. The interior streets were pretty much residential. The paint factory at the end of a very bumpy Horton Street, the Rocky Neck Railways at the end of Rocky Neck Avenue, the Rockway Hotel at the top of Fremont Street, and of course, Peter's Coffee Shop. The art galleries and restaurants added a bit of a cosmopolitan flavor to the neighborhood. The studio restaurant, with its piano bar down here, was perhaps the only gay bar in town, though decidedly closeted. The homes on Rocky Neck were occupied by a homogeneous population, Anglo-Saxons, Yankees, I guess you could call them, no Portuguese, no Italians. Though the central part of Gloucester had many, there were very, very few, even in Greater East Gloucester. In closing, I'll leave you with a couple of my dad's aphorisms, which no doubt inspired Jonathan. Uh, the first, he'd say, with a show of somewhat feigned disgust to either me or some other eager lad, I've shown you everything I know, and you don't know nothing. <laughs> and the other is a particular favorite of mine, paraphrasing what my dad was told by a crusty old, hard-bitten fisherman here in Gloucester when, when my dad was a youngster. He said, I feel sorry for you young fellas. You got so many years of suffering ahead of you. <laughs> ah. Oh yes, well it's true. I mean, a lot of times in those, what? Bill can hear you better with the mask off. Well, okay. no. <laughs> I, I don't even want to catch a cold. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm a wuss. That's okay. I will stay as a wuss. <laughs> I, I hope everybody can hear me, okay? Yeah. Way back? Good, good. Well, the Gloucester 400 has a good sound system here, so that's great. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking about, you know, the years of suffering. Um, yeah, our father kind of embraced suffering, even when he was like only 40 years old. <laughs> um, you know, which doesn't seem that old now, he would say, I'm over the hump and coasting down the other side. <laughs> so It's tough to get old. Yeah, yeah, he was like not, he was not a hardened optimist, but he, 
he would still see the bright side of things. I mean, you know, it's like he kept going as long as, but he didn't live that long. He was dead by 60, 64. So it was a good thing he took his social security at 62. <coughs> so, but um, I, I kind of wanted to emphasize how actually I think Jonathan and our father were more friends than we realized. Or Jonathan hung out there very observantly for a long time in the background, perhaps, at Sib's end. Because a lot of his quotes are very um, similar in rhythm, but not in words, you know? And so I just wanted to read, I have here the text, one of the mighty books. The text. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and this is um, in Jonathan's last book, the Gloucestermist book. And toward the end, there's, I haven't read this whole book, Kathy uh, Bayless pointed out to me some interesting excerpts. And this is one where it's a gathering of um, the power women of the city establishment. There's a city councilor, the wife of the mayor, the head of um, cultural organization, and they are hosting a lunch for this writer who has returned to Gloucester who started out as a Gloucester Daily Times journalist and became a you know, New York Times bestseller writer, that would be Kim Bartlett. And he's called Tim here, Tim Scriabin, which is, you know, is Jonathan's, you know, mi well, I guess they're not misnomers, but, you know, they're kind There's of... some like, connection. Yeah, yeah, right. There's always a connection. Yeah. He's very good yeah. with words. And so um, one of them, Tessa, said to Tim, did you come across our sardonic Watsibber, the truly rugged individualist? Tim replies, oh yes, the one-man Yankee dragger with his Cabotland water dog. He took me out on a few of his trips and let me steer while he was hauling nets. That's when I met Dogfish face to face. Oh, Tessa replied, he had a whole bag of aphorisms, most of them original. Caleb's favorite was, it's too early to predict and too late to repent. <laughs> what like to tell his highly educated Anglo-Celtic wife, Teddy, that she would be the smartest one in the cemetery. They were both very kind to Caleb when he was out of gainful work and working on his play. What used to sit in his rocky chair and tease him for making books. Unquote, unquote. But he said it with genuine respect. So that that really, you know, it gives it a sense of how, you know, he was friends with both our parents. And of course, we knew he was a friend of our mother. They were both intellectuals and progressive thinkers and all. But our father actually, he would, if he had ever had a chance, he would vote for the Prohibition Party which I think showed up on the ballot for quite a long time because he said that was the only way you could make money with a boat. So, because <laughs> the fishing industry was pretty depressed in those days, the 50s and 60s, and so um, he was right in that respect. So, but he was always a contrarian <laughs> in his way. Uh, but Jonathan sometimes... Um, he takes liberties with names, and also um, with some of the temporal aspects of things. Because the Cabotland water dog, which um, some of us here would know, would be the big black lab husky mix that was Peggy's dog. And she didn't get him till after Bill died. So the two of them never shared the planet together. But he did have dogs. And just like Jonathan, he was very fond of his dogs. And two of them that he had for many years was um, who he called Cruddy Beak and Low Dog. And Cruddy Beak was a, a Collie um, German Shepherd mix that we actually acquired from the Rockport Playhouse when they were shut, had to shut down at the end of the season. And Jeff Rashawn, who worked there, knew this poor dog had no place to go. He was a little puppy, and he'd spent a lot of his puppyhood in a station wagon. So Jeffrey said, Peggy, take this dog. 
he didn't ask the owners, you know. He knew that that was the right thing to do. So, of course, Peggy took the dog, and, and Bill really adopted him. And he was a wonderful dog. He lived for 17 years, and his real name was Skyler. But he did have this condition that collies have, which is they get like a sunburned nose. And it never would go away. It was always crusty and red and poor thing. But it didn't bother him. He lived and lived. And so um, mostly <laughs> he often was fed. He and Low Dog, which was what our father called a beagle-eyed bastard, because she was part basset hound, part beagle, and quite low. <laughs> and so, yeah. <laughs> and they would both be fed on stale donuts, from, I think at that time it was probably the Drift Inn. Mm -hmm. Yep. So they, but they did get regular dog food at home, but Dad loved giving them the stale donuts. But somehow they never got overweight. They just, you know, kept carrying along. But that's, that's the true dog history. So, <laughs> <laughs> which is important for people to know, because dogs are important to Jonathan. But anyway, um, I just wanted to tell some about Rocky Neck in the olden days because um, I, I really, well, I kind of was a kid here, you know, in the 50s. So it was quite different then. There were um, swarms of children running all over the place, driving the grown-ups nuts. You know, we were only one crowd of them, but um, we all would play together. Well, there was like two groups, the boys and the little kids. And I was supposed to be with the little kids because I was supposed to you know, keep an eye. So um, that was what happened. And sometimes we would get into conflict, but most of the time they would have their world, we would have ours. I would sometimes join the boys because one of my best friends had many brothers and we both go. But anyway, our favorite playing places, of course, being on Rocky Neck, were the shoreline. And in the wintertime, all the empty buildings where nobody lived, you could go to the Rockaway Hotel, climb up the fire escape, which was so high and wonderful, make clubhouses under the porches, and then go sledding in the, you know, in the winter on the hill behind their nice rocky hill. You could get a good run because you weren't allowed on the street. Although we did, Wanson Hill, well, I guess it's back here, that's such a, kind of like that, had a beautiful hill for sledding, and we would take that over too. But it was like... You know, I feel, I guess I feel sorry for the grown-ups. They didn't have a peaceful life on Rocky Neck in those days. <laughs> and then in the summertime, it was such fun because then the um, artists would show up and the summer people and they'd have kids and we'd all play together and we'd have um, like giant jumble sails, which, you know, we'd make little crafty things with rocks and driftwood and sell them to the tourists. And the tourists were, they were charmed by it, I guess, because we would make some money. It was good. And Susie O'Hara, who's going to speak this afternoon, will, will tell more about the artist side of things. But sometimes, you know, the artists would get up to shenanigans themselves because they had this Cape Ann Society of Modern Artists. They were like the Salon de Refuse of the Rockport and the North Shore Art Associations, who were very traditional. And they would, they, they, so it was like Casma for short. And they would have the Casma costume ball every summer. And it was a marvel of the beautiful costumes the artists would make. Of course, we weren't allowed to go to them. But one morning, we looked out, because we grew up in the um, big gray and white house there on the corner up, you know, sort of kitty corner from the parking lot. And we looked out across the street at our father's wharf there, and there was a mermaid caught in the net. My father would hang his nets up to dry there. And so we went across, and there was, she was, she was beautiful. Oh, oh, okay. And, <laughs> and there was a sign with it that said, Kilroy was here. And <laughs> so it was like, that evil Kilroy, you know, because I was just a kid. He kills mermaids and put, hangs them up to dry. It was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we, I know I could digress a lot more, I guess, about various things, but it is 10 o'clock. But I just wanted to set one scene, which was the, the, the water pollution, the horrible situation in the 50s 
um, you know, continuing into the early 60s until the um, sewer pipe was put in on Rocky Neck, which is how we ended up with that nice parking lot nowadays. That was all part of the shore. But when we played on the shore, we could play happily in like Wanson Cove, Oaks Cove. I mean, sewer pipes, every house on the shore had a sewer pipe that ran in. And we knew we shouldn't step on or in front of the sewer pipes. But, you know, we could run all around. But Smith Cove, you had to keep very close to the edge because Smith Cove doesn't get much tidal flushing. And basically, other than like 10 feet from the shore where you could walk, it was black mayonnaise, sewage sludge. It was horrible, and it stank at low tide. But things lived in it. There was like thousand-legged white worms, and they were like pearly. They were beautiful, you know? But we weren't really allowed to go get them because you could lose your boot. It was just, you would sink right in. So we, we had to keep our heads down if we were going there. But I, I just did, I want to tell one little story, then I'll, I'll oh, quit. Yeah. Um, well, about, and it wasn't just the sewage. It was also all the fish processors. Mm -hmm. They would dump the fish guts and everything the right into the water. The and pogey oil, oh, it was horrible, pogey oil. And it would show up on all the shores, but really collect on Rocky Neck in Smith Cove. So um, what, one of the places we love to play, though, I mean, you know, it's interesting on the shore, where the, the ways is, like you can see in that picture, the Peggy Bell, our father's boat, hauled up on the ways. But um, it's like a railway. We'll see the big railways later today. But he had his own. And when a boat wasn't there, it was a great place for kids, like a jungle gym, you know, to climb on and walk out on the rail, see how far you could get without losing your balance and falling in. Well, one day, um, Annie, our sister in Wales, who isn't here now, our, um, George and I were all playing on the ways, and it was a day of particular horrible tide. It had, like, frothing pink and orange fish guts and roe, you know, which is the fish eggs, the spawn. And so we were very careful, but there was a splash. And George, who's probably only four or five, he fell in. And he was covered with all this horrible orange stuff. <laughs> and so Annie and I, we rushed back across the street with him, but our mother wouldn't let us in the house. We had to hose him off in the yard before she let him come in for a bath. But he was very brave and stoic, you know. He just, he was, didn't swallow any, so it, that was good. Was first, of, first of many times I was hosed off, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that little railway still exists next to our place on Rocky Neck. That's right, and yeah. you still haul yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, George is really good because he carries on a lot of the old traditions. <laughs> and I'd just like to point out um, over here, the, the banner, the Sibzen Cultural Society here, is supported on a fine self-made tool <laughs> that George made. If you see the broom, it's reinforced, especially with his own rig, to be a pedestal. It was rather a quickie thing. Yeah, repurposing. Yeah, yeah repurposing. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. That is true. Yeah. 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 Well, Liz, I didn't know you had to mind the neighborhood children as well. I mean, well, I mean, she I, had to take care of me when I was younger. I thought that was kind of the. the but you're saying if kids went out to play, you were put in charge of them. That's sort of well. I, I had to watch over Annie and George. Yeah. And of course, George. George of course. There was yeah. there was age. I mean, everybody. Well, Annie had her friends, Debbie Kidder right. and um, Pammy Kidder right. and Anita Watson. I mean, it was just. So we ended up being a whole bunch of kids, because there was kids your age, um, Bobby Publicover, let's see, is that different ones. I mean, there was just lots of kids. Robert Groupie? Yeah, he was older, oh, though. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, he was older. He yeah, didn't run with us, he ran with the boys. But you had to be the responsible party here. Yes. Yeah. So if bad things happened, it was my fault. <laughs> but, but a lot of times, the bad things happened because we were having fun. Yeah. So yeah. I didn't mind. Yeah. It was, I, you know, it's like part of life. You yeah. do what you can get away right, with. Right. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. yeah, that was really... Yeah, it's one thing that strikes me now in Rocky Neck, there are almost no children here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 almost yeah. zero. Yeah. yeah. I can think of maybe one. Same up on Mount Pleasant, too. Yeah. That used to have yeah. many, many kids. Strange. Yeah, well, you were telling us. Yeah, right. no, Mrs. Puglisi um, did a account, I think probably back, I don't know, mid-60s, 
So she had this neighborhood concept, which would be, if you think of Mount Pleasant Avenue, it would have started at the fire station and then gone down to about um, where the Chisholms used to live, so kind of the top of the hill there. That was her idea of the neighborhood, and she counted up 75 children in that small area. <laughs> so there were, there were a lot of them everywhere. Rocky Neck also. But yeah. 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 It was the baby boom. Everyone it was, was definitely the baby boom. As my mother said once, she said, I don't know why we all had so many children. <laughs> but it was in the air. Everybody, you know, like five kids was like, that's what you did. No big well, deal. in the no. early days, she told me, we had to repopulate the world after World War II. Well, and she had been go. in World War II and seen people suffer and die. Yeah. So, you know, you can't... That was in the air, too. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So that, yeah. Was, that was one of the things. Yeah. 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 I know. So, um, yeah, she'd come from England. She met my dad during the war in England. Um, so she had seen the war. Yeah. 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 Oh, I just the one thing I didn't see, I couldn't go on and on. Go ahead. Terrible. Yeah. I just wanted to say one thing, a beautiful thing. Of um, you, Every few years in the 50s, there was a lovely event where the brigantine Yankee would return to Gloucester from the South Seas. And in those days, there was hardly any sailing boats. Yeah. And right. It's so great that we have I so know. many That's now. Yeah. But she yeah. was the only yeah. one who would come into the harbor yes. under sail. Yeah. People would wait for hours sometimes, you know, because you can't always have a schedule under right. sail. And they'd come out with boats. So many boats would come to greet her. We'd go out in our father's boat. And he would have the loudest horn of any. <laughs> he was a little boat, you know, Peggy Bell. She's only about 35 feet. But it was a big air horn, so they didn't blow it off. He was not, a, no. you know, he was a, a, a quiet man. But, you know, we would encourage him to blow the horn. And then after they landed, they stayed down here at the Rocky Net Railways that we're going to see. And then Irving and Electra Johnson, they were the captains of the Yankee. They would stay at our grandmother's house. She had a rooming house, you know, like an inn in the summer, on, you know, just in the same big old gray and white building where we grew up, and they would stay there. We would feel so special because they would give slideshows of the South Seas in my grandmother's living room. And so there it was, the whole, they put up a screen, the whole wall turned into a tropical island. Oh, we were so lucky, and we could see it. Right close. Anyway, that was one thing I wanted to say. But, you know, you might remember other things. And I love, Mern, what you were telling about hanging out there. You were... It's important to have a good hangout, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. going through the whole process of building the sublime mm. submarine. But a lot of the hanging out, our father, he would make fun of it sometimes. He yeah. would say, he'd say, well, we're waiting for the tide to come or the paint to dry. <laughs> there was always something, you know, right. going on very so many, quietly. Yeah, slow process, yes, slow right. process. Yeah. And he didn't mind, and he was always there like a, like a rock. He was mm -hmm. so trusty, yeah. So do folks have questions or comments about what, maybe your maybe some ideas are triggered in your minds. You know, I remember one thing. You yeah. Know, the railways where the boats come in and out. He's, ne next to the house, down here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, substance called Subco. Oh, Subco. 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 Oh, that stuff, yeah. Yeah, that he used to put on the rails. Stuff, you know, yeah. he, 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 also, he also painted the side of the house. Right, there. I remember that. Old motor oil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. He was, he was a Yankee, like I said, he was a Yankee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was really yeah. fun. Yeah, leaning on the house, not a good idea. No, no, no. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Yeah. Um, Joe Garland and I are pretty good friends. I visited him a lot. House. And he told me about when they operated the railway, they were actually calling out know, the Peggy, Peggy, Peggy Bell. Bell. Peggy Bell. One right here, Tom. Yep. And the casting was across the street in front of the gray and white house. And the wire would go clear across Rocky Neck Avenue. They yep. had to stop the traffic right, during right. the process. In the early days, and yes. It was like a big yeah. do, uh, a big show. Right. A big do. In yeah. the early days, yes. Yeah. And Joe Carl was, was very tight with your guests. Oh, he was. They yeah, were best they friends. Were very, they were very best good friends. friends. Yeah. 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 Wow. I know. It was so funny. I don't know if I tell that. It's like, oh, well, my, when, as kids, you know, we didn't know that 
we knew anyone on Eastern Point. Eastern Point was another world. We would just go there in the winter and trespass and explore the estates where no one was there. But one day, um, our parents went to a party on Eastern Point. And you know, it's like, oh, I didn't know they knew anybody there. And it was at Joe Garland's. But then when we drove by, you know, Dad, there was a boat, sort of a boathouse in the yard that you can see when you go by. And, um, you know, but then the beautiful, big, old, you know, grand house. And Dad would point to the boathouse and say, look, when the only comes back, Joe's got to live there. <laughs> so, so it's like he was, he was kind of playing on our disbelief. <laughs> when funny. the owner comes back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I remember one of the funny things. My father always said the boat pulled out front of the dock, you know. Yeah. And it, it, when it came back, you know, the father said it never, it didn't bring in anybody else's boat. <laughs> 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 uh. I mean, it, it was an old rowboat. Yeah, yeah. Took on water. Yeah. 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 Didn't rain on so, anyone else. Oh, so. this is Susie O'Hara, yeah. who, who lived right there in the studio. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it was for her father that the place was cleaned up every summer yeah. for Tom O'Hara, the artist. Yeah. 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 Who, did, who did this lovely painting here? Yeah. 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 This is a drawing. Yeah. Drawing. Yeah. Tom, yeah. Yeah. Tom was. Tom was an amazing illustrator. He was actually an official illustrator for the Navy. For NASA. And for NASA. And NASA. I remember That's when he came right. and gave a, a talk yeah. about the NASA drawings. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, we'll, we'll find out more, so that's great. Captain, you have our attention. Can you talk a little more about the fishing? Okay. Well, well, certainly, I mean, the fishing you know, Liz mentioned the horrible grubby tides that there were in the 1950s. A lot of that was from redfish processing. Redfish was sort of the, the fish that saved Gloucester. Um, Ocean perch. Ocean perch, thank you, Grace, yeah. They changed the name because redfish didn't sell. Right, anyway, it was the fish that sort of saved, you know, after the war, it was a booming redfish industry here, fish, a fishery here. And bo big boats were devoted to redfishing. And processing this, and, and processing menhaden, which are the pogies, made this horrible, Slime, and you know, there was a plant on the on the state fish pier, a dehydrating plant that processed the menhaden to use for chicken feed and animal feed, and you know, the, the stench was amazing. But you know, that was the smell of jobs. You know, the right, people, right. people working there. Yeah. Um, but it did have an effect on the harbor, certainly the the, the red fishing and the uh, the menhaden. Um, but no, it was a it was a busy, booming fishing port, no question about it. Um, all all dragging, some gill netting, no scalloping, but dragging. Um, for codfish and haddock and flounder, you know, sole. Um, and uh, that continued until, you know, probably in the mid-70s, uh, it sort of tapered off and with the Magnuson Act and all that. But no, in the 50s and 60s, when Jonathan was, in, in the 70s when Jonathan was here, fishing was, it was a, a big business. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, you could support a, you know, a, a, a man who wasn't high school, dropped out of high school, could make a, a middle-class living going fishing. You could support a family, pay a mortgage, pay them for the boat, going fishing. A person with, you know, again, with no, no much education. If he's willing to work hard, and did a lot of the work himself on the engine and the nets, of course. Um, so no, fishing yeah. was a big part. I mean, yeah. the, our, our, our town's greatest attribute is our harbor. That's, that's, a, that's what separates us from, I don't know, Reading or someplace, you know, you know or, or wherever, Andover. Um, we have this amazing harbor, and that's what drew the fishing here. Mm -hmm. Long may it continue. And our dad had the boat, the vessel set up so he could fish by himself. Yes, but I think he yes. really enjoyed George for many years. You yeah. would, would also yeah. be his crew, yeah. too. Yeah. So yeah. I think yeah. it probably went better to have the two people on board. Well, yeah, but he liked, well, he liked going by himself. He had his oh, yeah. system. He did. Yeah. No, yeah, he yeah. had his system. Yeah. He didn't depend on you. Yeah. Of course, yeah. you'd go off to school yeah. or whatever yeah. and he'd keep on. No, no the, well, 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 the joke that I made, I went fishing myself alone. And, and when you fish by yourself, you finally have someone who's as bright as you are, who laughs at all your jokes, who knows distinctly what you want to do. And I think my dad was, was like that. Um, you know, he wasn't, you know, he, he lost an eye during the war, and, um, and yet you wouldn't know it, you know, you had no, no, no inkling of any balance. kind of disability. And yeah, and he, and he was quick as a cat on the boat. I remember once mm. we, we, we dumped the, the net, the caught end full of fish, and this giant haddock came down, hit the deck, and was bouncing overboard, you know? And he reached out like a, a hockey goalie and just snatched it midair before it went in the water. It was, I was very impressed. Grabbed my tail like that. Bang! Like, wow, the old man's quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway. 
Yeah, yeah, and the whiting was a big thing yeah, too. Yeah, the whiting too. Yeah. The whiting yeah. every All that summer. Tonnage. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. man, yeah. and a lot of them had the fish eggs. You know, yeah. so it was probably wiping out generations. But yeah. you know, year after year yeah. though, they would catch loads of whiting. And there was, and, there was that plant you worked at in East Gloucester. Yeah, yeah. it's all yeah. like a parking lot now. Right. The king fisheries. Right, right. Yeah, my friend. If my friend Alice and I, as soon as we were 16, we got our social security yeah. numbers and yeah. went to work down the street, you know, packing whiting. Right. And we had to have rubber aprons and yeah. rubber boots, and when we got home, we had to hose them yeah. all off before we could go in the house. It's, it's right near where the Americold plant is now in East Gloucester. Yeah. It was a large yeah. fishing... But, you know, you right. felt like you were really part of the town yeah. working, so yeah. it was a good, yeah. a good thing to do, though yeah. it did make a big mess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But those, you know, those are middle class jobs that, of course, are gone now. Yeah, well, those, those Working weren't. Working class jobs. Those weren't. The, not not, not yeah. on the line. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. But no, fish no. cutting a was, lot. though. But it, cutting well, the, the fish. Well, the men, it was sex Yeah, it was definitely sex. Yes, sex. it was. Yeah, yeah the yeah. men were on the front of the line, yeah. Yeah. you know, and they would yeah, they do were the cutting. Back. Yeah. And then we'd have to pack them. All yeah. the women right. would have to pack yeah. them in the boxes. Oh, you weren't doing cutting. No, no, no. But we'd pack them in the boxes. Of course, it would be just all slime everywhere. Because the fish cutting was a real skill. Yeah, yeah. Yes, the women just packed. And a lot of them. They lived over town. They had rough right. lives. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Me and Alice, and there was another girl, friend, Frances Ciccoloni, yeah. and her mother was one of the people who worked there too. Right. Right. And every time in the break room, a lot of the women would go and put on their eyeshadow and lipstick wow. again. It was like, even though oh, they were bless. looking at fish, but they oh, had pride. Bless. Absolutely. And, yeah. and Mrs. Ciccoloni, she would say to her daughter, Frances, she said, Frenzy, frenzy, forgot to my lipstick, forgot to my eyeshadow, because you never use yeah, that. No, no, no. She was uh, so funny. Yeah. But anyway, wow. you, I think we, you had a question? Uh, I just wonder what sort of fishing your dad did. Was that he, he had a dragger? Was yeah, he, he went dragging. Bottom fish? Or yeah. yeah. Fish no, 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 no. Not at no, all. No, no. Small scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah small, yeah. small scale, Tom. He, um, yeah. he, you know, a codfish, haddock. He was, he was always searching for the gray soul. Yes. Yeah. Gray soul. He definitely gray soul. floundered. Yeah. 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 And he'd, he'd use like a... What's that? A day trip. D exactly, all, a day trip, yes. Yeah, pretty yes. much all yes. Just yeah. a day trip. Right? Yeah. Oh, various Madrugas. places over in town. Madrugas, which is now part of I-4C2. There was a yeah, fish wharf there. Yeah, it was all torn down. Yeah. And then Dick Wright. Madrugas, and then John Wright's, which is actually near where Liz worked, here yeah. in East yeah. Gloucester yeah. Square. Yeah. So was that was that a, a main source of income for him? Or oh, it, it, it fed the family. It was, yeah, well, raised the family. So. Well, very much so. Yeah. Wow. So that was mostly the uh, wintertime. No, 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 no. He fished no, all year, year round. No, it was yeah. more more of a summer and good weather. In fact, yeah. our dad would was very careful about weather because yeah. he was fishing alone. Yeah. He would do these shore checks every day, and I never yeah. quite understood. Yeah. Again, another mysterious process. He would look out, you know. Yeah. To the horizon, like he was seeing something. Yeah. He was making a decision. Yeah. Yeah. Never I, told us what he was seeing, but it was a okay. I don't think I'll be going tomorrow, kind of thing. No, and, 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 and of course, the check on the shore is mentioned in Gloucester Tide. Oh, it is. It talks right. about checking the yeah. shore. Yeah. 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 You always yeah. check the shore. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah but up towards right. Jeffrey's, Jeff, yeah. Jeffrey's Ledge, up in that area. Well, you know, kind of, and then down towards Boston. Kind of, well, he had to stay, yeah. he, he had a thing where we'd look at the shore for his marks, where to set the net, line up. Rockport Water Tower with a certain white house. Yeah. He had this whole system, we called them his marks. Yeah. Of getting his marks in line yeah. and showing, you know, he had a sounding machine too, you know, a, a yeah. phenometer. A depth sound. But he yeah. also, you know, the marks, he had to see his marks. Yeah. Where so to begin with. Well, you had to stay three miles out. Yeah. It was yeah. the law. And did he fish the oh, oh, oh. bank as well? What's he? Still alive? Yeah, you get out there sometimes, but, sometimes. but ma mainly he was within sight of shore. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. had to get back. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, he came back every night. But he wasn't. He wasn't sometimes always. He, was he wasn't always um, three miles out. He had to watch out for what he, what he called the worm warden. The worm warden. Well, yeah. then, but then he had that great contract um, in Salem. Oh, he did. He did. oh with where the biologist. Could, he could, with the biologist. So he, right. he, he he did quite a bit of research over the years with different biologists from the. Um, the state fisheries for, for the Salem power plant. Uh, yeah, and so yeah. they had a study where they were trying to figure out if the warm water that was being put into the harbor all the time in Salem, when they had that big old ugly coal-fired plant, was that affecting the fish? Right. So that was great because you know then he could fish right yeah. there. It's like I, mean, I went along with him on some of those. That was yeah. fun. Yeah, yeah. And he, yeah, Dad would whoop, take his whoop, daughters whoop. along. He did. Kathy, oh, Catherine, it's time. Before you end, I hope you talk about the fishermen's lives and your mother's role in it. 
Yeah. Oh, goodness, yeah. that's a long but story. That, yeah. How many minutes do we have? Well, I, I, I think one, one of the... One, uh, 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 Ten minutes? Uh, uh, I'll, just, I'll just start off with one quick remark. My, my mother was very involved with the Fisherman's Wives starting in the late 60s, early 70s. One of the founders. One yeah. of the founders. Yeah. And um, she, was, um, she was one of the, the two co-presidents. And the other co-president said, Peggy, I am president. You are co-president. <laughs> <laughs> she was a very forceful Italian woman who did amazing work in this town. Yeah. 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 And now, George, was the, as I understood, the fisherman's wives really got active because of the fish not oil on George's back. Absolutely. That, yeah, was, that was a trigger. Oh, I think so. Yeah. yeah. That I remember. Yeah. Okay. Right, yeah. right. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. Because they had this big scheme in the mid-70s to... Um, you know, open up George's Bank for oil drilling. Mm. And that's when the Fisherman's Rights really got active. They put out a cookbook. Yeah, they, they, had, a, and they then, had a national campaign. They oh, were really, yeah. they went to Washington, they did a lot. Yeah. And it was actually great. This was during the Carter years, right? right. Jimmy right. Carter. And um, at one point, I mean, you may not remember, but Rosalind was, Rosalind, whatever, his wife, first lady, mm. was a very active first lady, and she traveled a lot. And there was one point, you can tell the story, Roger, that she made it to the bottom part of Illinois, southern Illinois, like off the beaten path, and you... You have to be here and say, you know, we're very concerned here in southern Illinois with your plans for uh, uh, putting oil rigs on George's back. <laughs> she was... <laughs> like, wow, people in Illinois are upset about George's bank. That's something. Uh... So. Well said, Roger. And she yeah. did tell you. She said, I, I've heard of George. I know about George's bank. Or she, yeah. she give you a little pushback, right? Yeah. I don't know yeah. what she said. Yeah. 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 Right. So, <laughs> so, yeah, it was, uh, that was the trigger for it, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. yeah. and then after that was solved, they went on to um, raise money and have the beautiful Fisherman's Wife statue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was a long, long And getting project. health insurance for fishermen, I think. Was yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 Practical things, yeah. too. Yeah. 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 No, it's good. They're but I did just want to say, um, even though this, the fishing industry is generally, you know, very, very sex divided, because it was a big superstition that you shouldn't have women out on fishing right. boats. My father was a very bold man, and I went out, and Annie went out, yeah. and you well, went well, out. Well, 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 and so, also, yeah. he was one of the very few non-Italians or Portuguese who went dragging. True. There, there weren't very many. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so my mother was one, was one of the very few non-Italian or Portuguese women in the Fishman's Wives, which is a little yeah. interesting for her. Yeah. Well, it's good. She loved culture. That's culture. So, yeah. But it, it's sort of like, on the whole, I mean, you had asked about whether, I mean, it wasn't entirely the fishing income we lived on. Because Truth be told. losing it, our father was so lucky. He lost just an eye in World War II. You know, he could have been in D-Day and died totally. Because he was in England training for it. But he lost an eye by um, being hit in the dark on his bike during the blackout because people had to drive without headlights. And he almost died from that you know, brain injury, but it was before he was shipped off to D-Day. Mm. So he was so lucky. And then he could get veterans' benefits. I mean, they weren't huge, no. but it was, they were wonderful. It was they were wonderful. They were related check. to the children. So he could have more children and get a little more. It wasn't a huge benefit. So, so I don't that, think it was that, is that big. Is that what drove them to have a larger family? Maybe that's why they all had so many kids. I, I'm, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a veteran's benefit, am I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful what they did. Oh, but, it, but unfortunately, you know, it was, mostly, it was almost entirely, I think, for the white veterans. Because mm. the black veterans, they didn't get education. They didn't right. get the mortgages. So, you know, mm. we've got a lot of reparations in this country to do. But mm -hmm. that's, that's another subject. It, but it's like, you know, it's not, I mean, the fishing was certainly really important. But okay. Dad would be proud that he didn't have to go on social, which most fishermen had to do in the winter. Or unemployment. You mean. Yeah. yeah, well, okay. they called it social. Yeah. House of Gold. Go on social. To go to yeah. the House of Gold. Right, yeah. that's right. Yeah. He didn't have to yeah. do that. He definitely got us through the he winter. He had the yeah. veterans benefit. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, hey, it's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's... But maybe we should end up on a, well, that's sort of a positive note. That, it is. You know, well, it's kind of a Zen it, thing, right? As you say, you have this terrible injury, but you're lucky, you know. Yeah, yeah that's a good so. point. Oh, he's yeah. always a lucky man. Yeah. I mean, yeah. even when bad lucky. things happen. He was a lucky man. Yeah, could he, he was And he was lucky. particularly lucky in his wife. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Oh, he, he'd be the first he, to say he, so. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, even though she, he mocked about her being despised in the cemetery. And he'd always talk about outliving his widow, very ironically. Well, he, right? he would always say, I am known as Peggy's husband. And Peggy's husband, yes. Right. <laughs> Because our mother was very active in local yeah. politics. Yeah. He was on the school board for a while. Yeah. yeah. So, any more questions? Do you, do you remember if Laura Tompkins came in with a Wandenberg around the same time as Johnson? No, do I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember that. I've heard of the name Wandenberg, the boat, but I'm not familiar with that coming I, I in. Think that they, I, I, I haven't figured that out. Yeah. I think they came in at just about the same time, and he put kids around. Too. Yeah, he was a lovely boat, the Wonder Bird. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Uh, I don't. Sterling Hayden certainly had a boat. Of course, Sterling Hayden. It's interesting. Sterling Hayden was also one of the folks who stayed at our grandmother's apartment house uh, when he was here for the 1938 uh, schooner races. When he was a crewman on the T boat, Sterling Hayden stayed there as I think a, a teenager. Yes, exactly, Tom. Yes. Yeah, he was on the T boat. Yeah. yeah. Wanderer, yeah. I think, was his book. Yeah. yeah well, his book was his book was called Wanderer. It's Sterling Wanderer. Hayden's book. Yeah. Oh, Wanderer. Wanderer was named his book. I think Wanderer, if I'm not mistaken, was here uh, last winter. Or the winter yeah, before, it may have been. It's, it's here uh, now, I think. It's here now. Or was here last week when I was paddling last around. Week, because I was sailing my sunfish around in the winter time. Wanderer was there. Yeah. Yeah. Big uh, steel. I think a double lander. Yeah. About about fifty sixty feet. Yeah. Oh, it's quite grand, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but don't remember, I mean, the, the Yankee was the big thing, but I guess it's time. No, three okay. minutes, three minutes, three minutes. Oh, three minutes. Oh, yeah. well, okay, the small print. <laughs> the small print. Thank you, Sandy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I anyway. guess people came to stay at, you know, at yeah. our grandmother's because our grandfather worked at the Rocky Net, I mean, railways. So she had the nearest place. So maybe he he told them all, oh, "Go down to my wife's yeah. place." He might have been. Place he might have helped her get some business. It could have been the yeah. connection. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I hadn't yeah. thought of that. Yeah. Right, because yeah. it wasn't like she did any big advertising. Oh or no, no, anything. can't quite picture a, that. No, it wasn't a grand place, but yeah. it was comfortable, yeah. you know, yeah. and nearby. So that was the thing they could just Location. walk down the street. Yeah. 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 No, Sterling Hayden was one of the the many who've kind of come, you know, come wandered through our town. He was, it was something. Yeah. But that was before our time. Really. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That Certainly was the my depression. time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Murren, your time is, is still ongoing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, and of course, we can't leave without, my, and talk to my father without mentioning our, his, one of his dear friends, Grace. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you guys, you are, guys are great buddies. Great, yeah. great friends. Yeah. He was yeah. my best friend. Yeah. yeah. And he, he, we were worst enemies at first. <laughs> So how, how did you meet Grace? Was it at, at was it at Peter's the restaurant or? You know I don't know. I remember <clears throat> going down to the wharf and there was a sign that said, "Look out, urban right. is coming." Right, <laughs> urban is coming. Yeah. Urban renewal. It was yeah. urban renewal. And of course, I was a dummy. I, you know, got out of Katie Gibbs. I was nineteen. It was my first job. It was a at the um, chamber of commerce. Yeah. And that I thought. Urban's great. Urban renewal. Urban's yeah. great. You know, that's what everybody around me said. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. renewal. Yeah, yeah. it's renewal. And somehow your father knew yeah. that I I was working for Urban. Urban. <laughs> so I went down there, and he kicked me off yeah. the floor. Wow. He did. He was really... In no uncertain that's terms. The only, the only time, or twice I've seen him really be angry. One was... After the Fourth of July parade, when oh God, oh yes, oh yeah, that oh, was a yeah. oh, horrible oh, transformation. That was, that was, <laughs> he had this old red Volkswagen van that he loved, and it, he had it forever. And anyway, so Peggy um, did the Harvest parade, right. and she made the, the the van into a Union Jack. Yeah, and all the stripes. Yeah, that was at the bookstore. Yeah, yeah, which he did not approve of. Right, but then. The day after, I was with him the day after, yeah. and I, he, I knew he was angry about that. Yeah. And it drove down the neck, and it was still, oh, yeah. in, somehow, somebody had promised it would be all be taken care of. And he was like, yeah. who was that? Uh, somebody who staunches, it, 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 yeah. some, the grim fairy tale, that guy. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Still, well, still 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 yeah. Yes. I couldn't believe it. 
<laughs> no, no, certain things enraged him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. one of them, but yeah. <laughs> only, only temporarily. I have that when I need it. <laughs> Thank you so much, dear siblings. Well, thank you for, Catherine, giving us a chance to talk. talk. Yeah.